I've got something here this morning that's really going to help you. I understand my dream now. So you say, what dream? Well, I had this dream last night where I saw a tree. And I saw the tree being cut down. And it left a, a stump, you know, maybe a foot high or so, left a stump. I saw a hand come down and take a hold of the top of the stump and wiggle it back and forth like this and pluck it right out. And that's significant because I understand, uh, and you will too as we get into the Word this morning, what I want to share with you. It's going to help you. It's really going to help you. I dare say some of you have never thought of these things, but it's a part of what what the Holy Spirit reveals in our lives, even after we're Christians and all of our sins are forgiven. Sometimes there's deeper issues or stumps left in our lives that need to be removed. Maybe you've cut things off, but you've never allowed God to, to wiggle the stump and pluck it out. So it's, it's, it's a deeper work in your life. Having your Bibles, would you go to 1 Timothy chapter 4 here this morning? First Timothy chapter 4. I encourage you to bring your Bibles or bring your cell phones with your Bibles on them. And uh, that way you can look at the Holy Scriptures. We also, uh, Jay back there, he, Big Jay, he does a great job getting Scriptures up and so forth. But, you know, if you also see it in your Word and your hand, you know, this is the one book where you can really feel God. Right there he is. Mm, all 66 books of him. Right there. Uh, th this, it's almost time for a new Bible. This one, you know, I've, I've used it for quite a bit and it's getting those yellow pages. The it still has some white pages in it, the yellow pages and the white pages, but, but, uh, I, I love to wear my Bibles out. Don't you? Yes. Whoa. Yep, yep. Okay. So anyway, in first Timothy chapter four, I want to encourage your heart here this morning because there's something that is going on and. And uh, all of those words you heard this morning by these different vessels of the Lord, they were coming and bringing prophetic words, admonitory words, admonishing words. These are all things that should be going on in the church. And they should bear witness with our spirit and all of those things did. And they should lift us and encourage it. Always, you know, admonitory words, admonishing words, uh, prophetic words. You know, you always have those elements that even if they're strong, they're still they're going to build you up. Yeah. They're going to comfort you. They're going to build you up. They're going to strengthen you. Yeah. And Paul brings that out. You know, those of you who have been going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and you've been reading through that, you see that those elements are always found. And there at the church in Corinth, they had a tremendous group of people there, and they, and they knew how to move in the Spirit. I mean, the Corinthians, uh, they, they were moving in the Spirit. And the gifts of the Spirit were evidence, you know, that's listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And in Romans chapter 12, those gifts were evident, and they were flowing in that church. And Paul was saying, well, I, I know you, you're operating in those gifts, but here's chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, and that's about the love of God. Because in the New Testament, all the gifts of the Spirit, minister of the Spirit, is love-based. Yeah. Yeah. It's all love-based. And the thing that God wants us to see is how that in everything he says and does, just like this morning, there's a divine purpose in it for you and me. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus are called the pastoral epistles. And the reason they're called that is because Timothy is right. Paul is writing to young Timothy. Paul's nearing the end of his days. Second Timothy is the last letter that Paul ever writes, ever writes. And then he's martyred. He's put to death. But he's writing to this young man, Timothy, because he wants to encourage him. Timothy, as we know from ancient church history, was the pastor in Ephesus. So, you know, your, your epistle, as you look at your Bible... And you read the, the epistle to the Ephesians. Why, Timothy was the pastor of that. The apostle John also was a part of that church. Uh, Jesus' mother Mary, we know, was a part of that church. There were a number of early spiritual luminaries who were part of the Ephesian church. And Paul's encouraging Timothy. He's a young man. Uh, he's a bit timid about stepping out, leading God's people. 
And Paul is encouraging him to step out, let no man despise your youth, you know, but lead, lead God's people. He's very strong about what he tells Timothy to do, both Timothy and young Titus. Titus was another young man he had. Uh, Timothy was part Jewish and part Gentile. Titus was uh, a Gentile. That's like you and me. If you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile. And so Paul's writing to these young men to encourage them in the ministry, to strengthen them. And of course, uh, it was the Holy Spirit through Paul, and that's why they're in our Bible. The thing I want you to see is what God says through Paul. We talk about the prophetic element operating in the church, and Paul, as well as your early church, was most prophetic. For the first, first three centuries, the church of Jesus Christ, the first three centuries, one century, two century, three centuries, up until the fourth century, was most apostolic and prophetic. Signs, wonders, miracles, healings, raising of the dead, everything took place until the fourth century when Constantine, the Rome, uh, emperor of the Roman Empire, became a Christian, quote unquote, and then he Christianized the Roman Empire. Right. And he said, throughout my kingdom, everyone who will become a Christian, I'll give you a sovereign of gold and I think a white garment is what he promised them back in those days. And so the church was inundated with people who were not saved. Come on now. Who did not know the Lord Jesus Christ, who were not born again. And the old saints, the men and women coming out of the first three centuries and those who had been persecuted and had suffered and martyred them and had been beaten and tortured, they, they protested this. You, you have to be a student of early church history, but they didn't want this because they knew that this would dilute the, the power of the church. And while it became more famous and very rich which is evidences that you have today in the Roman Catholic system, one of the richest entities upon the face of the earth, one of the major landowners in all the major, uh, of, off on the face of the earth. They had all of this wealth and power, and yet they were like the Laodicean church. You don't know that you're poor, you're blind, and you are naked. And the Lord Jesus was saying that which is a prophetic word for all the church and all the ages. The thing, the reason I'm rehearsing all this to you is I want you to see this because here's Paul, he's telling Timothy, and you have to understand that the first century Christians, they didn't think there was going to be a second century. They thought Jesus was coming in their time. The second century Christians didn't think there would be a third century. They thought Jesus was coming in their time. The third century Christians, they didn't think there would be a fourth century. They thought the Lord Jesus would return in their time. And every true believer carries that hope in their heart. And all those who love his appearing are preparing themselves for his coming. Yeah. So the thing that I want you to understand is what Paul says here. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And notice what he says. The Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. He simply means, do you, do you, do you feel, do you get convicted about things and, and, and have a conscience about things where you know right and wrong? He's saying that these men and women, in the last days, their conscience will be seared. They will think nothing of lying, think nothing of cheating. Their conscience is seared, as it were, with a hot iron. It's been cauterized. And so they have no feeling about that. One of the greatest treasures that God gives you is the fact that you, you feel about right and wrong. That it troubles you. It's a great treasure to have that. And you see, that conscience becomes educated. It becomes enlightened. The more light... And the more you grow in God and in Christ, the more that conscience becomes enlightened. And you become ever more sensitive about what pleases the Lord and what doesn't. Yeah. And what should be going on in your life and what isn't. And, and this is a growth spiritually. And this sharpens in, in your life as you continue to walk on with the Savior. 
But in these last days, the Holy Spirit was speaking through Paul and telling them that, telling Timothy, warn the church about this. There are coming those who will speak lies and hypocrisy. They're hypocrites. They appear as one thing, but they're lying to your face. And their conscience is seared as with a hot iron. Here's a couple of the deceiving doctrines. One is they're forbid, forbidding to marry. And the command to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good. Nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving. For it's set apart, sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Those are a couple of doctrines that have been permeated down through the centuries about, you know, uh, the still the Old Testament restrictions on food about you can eat this and can't eat that. Or that you shouldn't marry. And that became a predominant doctrine uh, beginning in the fourth century in a certain church element. And they had monasteries and cloisters. And people would hide themselves away instead of going out into the world and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is what they did in the first three centuries. You have to be real careful about this religious stuff. It's a, there's always a deceiving spirit behind it. Anyway, did you notice what he said here in verse 1? The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, expressly says, in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, which can only mean they were in it once. And they will be giving heed to deceiving spirits and the teachings of demons. One of the things that the church has always been known for and must be, it's stand for truth and it's resistance to Satan and the powers of darkness or deceiving spirits, demons. And one of the things we must do is understand that God is wanting to set us totally free as sons and daughters of the living God to where we're not touched by darkness at all. Remember Jesus, he's getting ready to go to the cross and he's telling the disciples, he says, he says, he says, the evil one, the ruler of this world is coming, but he says, he has nothing in me. Well, he has a reference to the devil, Satan, who ruled over the kingdoms of men, but Jesus was coming to change that. And yet that Satan had nothing in him. Satan is to have nothing in you nothing you remember you can cut the tree off and still have a stump God wants you to deal with the stump I understand my dream now yeah. he wants you to deal with the stump yeah. we're told that God never tempts anyone but every man is tempted of his own heart of his own lust right. and that lust if you give into it instead of dealing with it if you give into it it will draw you away and lust will conceive sin, and sin will bring forth death. The Apostle James, he writes that. Of course, you, you know that reading your Bibles. But the thing I want you to understand is dealing with deceiving spirits. Deceiving, dealing with the teachings of demons. And being freed from those things. And Paul gives a couple of the obvious about not marrying and only eating certain foods. But the thing that I, I want you to see this morning, there is something deeper... And Paul, he, he deals with this in the church constantly. Over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm moving around just a little bit, but I want you to see this. Paul here is talking about the communion. And the, the Corinthian church had a little trouble. Uh, the, well, Paul says, he says, man, you've got all these gifts operating in you, but you're carnal. And one of the problems that the early Corinthian church was is they had all this outward spirituality and the gifts flowed through them, but they were carnal. And he says in, in the early chapters of, of the epistle to Corinthians, he says, uh, he says, there are schisms and divisions among you, and you do this and you do that, and you cut your brother and sister off, and da-da-da-da-da. He says, are you not yet carnal and are acting like mere men? Wow, that, I want to tell you, that hit me one day. I thought, Lord Jesus, am I acting like just a mere man rather than as a son of the living God? You know, there's a difference. And so the Lord, you know, really dealt with me about that. And am I acting just like a mere man, like all the other men out here? Or 
Am I acting different being one of his children, my father's children, and one of his sons, one of his, you know, uh, chosen ones? It makes a difference. So Paul is really coming on here, and, and he's, he's telling them to flee from idolatry. Verse 14 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, My beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge yourselves what I say. And I hope you're judging what I say this morning. That it should be bearing witness with your spirit. This is right. This is true. The cup of blessing which we bless. He's talking about the communion cup and eating the communion bread. The cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break. Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, and he's going beyond the mere cup and the bread, we, the church, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread, right. who's Jesus, of course, we partake of him. Observe Israel after the flesh, are not those who eat of the sacrifices partake of the, partakers of the altar. He's talking about the priests who would come and they would offer the sacrifices, and then the priests would eat of the sacrifices. This is how they lived. They lived off the offerings of the people. It's been this way from the beginning with, under, under the law of Moses. He says, what am I saying then? That an idol is anything, or what is offered to idols is anything. Rather, the things which the Gentiles, the Gentiles, not Jews, but Gentiles, sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons. And not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. <laughs> Folks, don't be hobnobbing with demons. See, don't be allowing anything to draw close to you like that, any form of darkness. Don't be hobnobbing with demons. Don't be fellowshipping with demons. You cannot drink the cup, verse 21, the cup of the Lord, the Lord Jesus, and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? An interesting statement. Uh, you know, the, the jealousy of the Lord is something... Um, both most beautiful and also terrifying. And, and the jealousy of the Lord for us, his people, uh, is most beautiful because he will stand up and protect us and defend us. But against his enemies, his jealousy arises and he can deal with them. Even the New Testament God. Amen. Amen. All right. So don't be partakers with demons. No, you know, you're not, you just don't want to cut the tree off, sin, and that tree of sin falls. You don't want to leave the stump. Yeah. You want to let the hand of the Lord come down and remove that from your life. Yeah. So you don't hold on to lies. You don't hold on to lust. You don't hold on to the things that would destroy you or your family. And you move totally away, and you seek by the grace of God to live above sin and in a place of righteousness. And we're not talking here about being perfect, perfect, because there's only one who is perfect. That's our Father in heaven. And yet Jesus says that we're to love like him. And so the Father wants to build his heart of love in you and build a culture of love in you, the love of the Father in you for others. So that when you look at others, you won't lust after them, but you will love them in purity. I was moving around in the Walmart yesterday with Cindy. And I'm saying, Lord, help me see all these different people the way you see them. Yeah. I'm praying specifically to the Father about this. Father, help me. And, and I mean, there's all, you know, there's all varieties and all kinds, you know. And I'm saying, Lord, help me to love them. If you want me to engage them anyway, help me to love them in any way that you want me to love them. And share your son with them. And there was young, one young lady there. Um, yeah, I won't t name her. She had her name tag on. But, uh, you know, one young lady there. And we just, Cindy and I just engaged her about a transaction we were doing. And it was nothing heavy. Nothing, nothing, nothing heavy. But I just said, um, I said uh, to, something to the effect, you know, you're just full of life. I said, you enjoy doing this? Oh, yeah, I, I enjoy this more than being a cashier. How am I going to get around this without telling them her name? Anyway. Anyway, I just want to tell you that, that the Lord calls me to see her. 
in a way that uh, you normally wouldn't see her. I don't know how else to say it to you, except you begin to look at people and you begin to deal with people on the level of the father rather than as a mere man. Amen. Yeah. And so Paul here says, don't be hobnobbing with demons. Look, you're drinking from the Lord. You're eating at his table. Don't be messing around with demons. And the point is, he's talking to them about idolatry, having other gods. Oh, you say, oh, all right. Okay, I don't, I don't have any other gods. Well, is there anything you put before God in your life? And I'm talking about, I mean, to the extreme. Folks, you, you, you got to live out your life. You, there's things you have to do. You know, you're not going to make it to every church service. You're not going to make it to every worship practice. There are things that come up in your life you have to deal with. I'm not talking about any of that, that level of stuff. I'm talking about where you exalt. And one of the things you don't want to exalt is some demon over your life. Yeah, yeah. Come on now. And, and the way you do that is you deal with the things that demons operate in. They operate in darkness. I gave a, uh, I had a, there was a brother with me Friday. He's uh, um, from England originally. He's living here now, but he's a Welshman. Uh, he's Welsh. And he heard about the conference. He's a prophet. And he was coming through and he contacted me because he had seen my message from last Sunday online and he wanted to come meet me. So we had lunch together. And I brought him over to the church and he walked in and right away he was picking up things in the spirit. He was speaking to me most edifying, most uh, blessed and challenging me in the spirit about some things. And then we came up and we're sitting right up in these front seats and we're talking with each other. I spent about two hours with him and, and uh, we're getting ready to leave. And just before he leaves, you know, I just suddenly see an owl. You know an owl? I just suddenly see an owl. Now you have to understand, I know that this guy, this dear brother, he's an eagle in his heart. Matter of fact, he drives a semi right now, an 18-wheeler. And on his truck, on that airfoil up above, there's a great big eagle. So it's prophetic. And then I hooked up with him, but I see this great big owl. I said, you know, I just saw an owl, and then I had a word for him, how that he's going to be able to move into darkness and be able to see. You know, owls can see in the darkness. I said, you will move in the darkness, and you will be able to take the prey, just like, a, just like an owl. I said, you will move in inconspicuously. You know, owls, when they fly, they make no sound. Do you know that? They have very soft tip feathers on their wings so when they fly they make absolutely no sound that's why they can see a mouse out there 50 yards and just go and they got him because he never hears them coming i said this is you you're going to move in and jesus christ is going to crush satan under your feet well i gave that word and he's quiet and we kept talking a little bit we get right back there about where Don and Carl is. He says, you know, my favorite bird is the owl. And the Lord has spoken to me on more than one occasion about how that he was making me an owl. And I just want to tell you that God is wanting to use us in this fashion and bring out that which is not obvious. To quit being an ordinary man or an ordinary woman and allow the spirit of the Lord to show you things about others and to help them and to minister to them. So in dealing with what I'm talking to you about, you have to deal with the occult in your life if you've never dealt with it. Occult simply means hidden. And remember last week, I brought out Deuteronomy 18 uh, about when you're coming, God was telling the people of Israel, when you come into the land that you're now going to possess, the peoples of all those lands that you're now going to possess, 
They went to seances. They had fortune tellers. They went to mediums. You know, they went to psychics. You know, they would, in effect, go to other gods to get information. Do you know that, that if you've ever dabbled in the occult and have ever had your fortune read, if you've ever played with tarot cards, Ouija board, ever had a seance, anything like that, and you're seeking to obtain information, revelatory information from anybody except the Most High God through Jesus Christ, that's in effect the same as appealing to another God. And if you've never dealt with the occult in your lives, then of course you want to deal with it. And the passage the Lord gave me, and I see this now very plainly, was out of Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, here's the Apostle Paul. He goes to Ephesus. We're back to Ephesus. He goes to Ephesus. And while he's there, <clears throat> he encounters these disciples. And he said, as in verse 2, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. They, they mean the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he said to them, well, into what were you baptized? And they said, well, into John's baptism. And Paul says, well, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to people that they should believe on him or Jesus who would come after him that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they believed they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. So how deep do you have to be, how mature do you have to be to speak in tongues and prophesy? Well, about an eight-year-old, like Tristan, or a four-year-old, or like one of our daughters, spoke in tongues when she was three. I'm just saying to you, saints, yeah. something's happening here. Yeah. Paul's back in Ephesus. And in men, there were about 12 of them. And Paul went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning, persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples. And then he went reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. The school of Tyrannus, again, historical. You can you do ancient studies. It was a very powerful early uh, school of theology and, and spiritual thought. And Paul would go in there and he would reason and preach the gospel. Uh, he would seek to reach them. And he separated the disciples from the unbelievers because they became hardened. You know, when people resist the gospel, then uh, uh, there's a grace that lifts off of them. And the, the next thing is the hardening of the heart. And this is, there's a process, and I, you, know, you see this, where they begin to resist the gospel, they resist Christ, and the grace that is on them, uh, they frustrate it, and it, it begins to lift off of them, and then the heart begins to harden, become like a stone. And, and um, Paul didn't want that to happen here to these disciples and listening to those who were resisting the gospel coming through his mouth. So he's, he pulls them apart. Now, just, just notice this, that this continued in verse 10 for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. It's wonderful. Paul stayed there for three months ministering, and then he stayed another two years. And he, the word of God went out in, in all over. And notice in verse 11, God worked unusual miracles, unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from Paul's body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of people. So people would come to Paul and just lay an apron or a, a handkerchief or a cloth against him. And there was such a presence and an anointing upon the Lord that that cloth then would, would carry that. It wasn't the cloth, it was the anointing of God upon the cloth. And as they would put them on their loved ones, the diseases would lead the people and they would be healed. Or the evil spirits would leave, leave them and they would be set free. And beloved, this is something you and I want to aspire to 
and desire to have such a, a, a relationship with the Lord Jesus and such an intimacy with him that the Lord could trust us with that kind of an anointing. Because anything the Lord tells us about, it's yours to have if you'll pursue it. So here, I want you to see, and beginning in verse 13, I'm getting where I'm going, but some itinerant Jews, exorcists, and exorcists, beloved, uh, were simply people, Jews, in that time, they knew about demons. This is nothing new. And they had people who would go around. They were known as exorcists, and they would cast demons out of people. Yes, even in the Old Testament, under the name of Yahweh, in the Old Testament covenant, the Old Covenant, you could deal with demons. And, you know, you get all kinds of education as you read the word. And so they come and they took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exercise you, we command you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. (laughs) Now, the point is, is they don't know this Jesus whom Paul is preaching. They're just using the name of Jesus because they've seen Paul do it. Right. They've been standing out in the crowd, you know, and Paul's up there and he's dealing with people and the demons are coming out of people, you know, some screaming, some vomiting, some shaking, others, you know, just their, their, their faces and their whole being is just transformed because they're set free from that darkness that's overshadowed them. And, and that's what these exorcists, they had seen this. And there were seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. So all these brothers. But look at this. And the evil spirit answered and said, well, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Now you have to understand these demons are using the voice of the man. That's pretty common. If you've ever been involved in deliverance sessions, uh, demons will speak through people. I've had that. And they'll speak through people. And you know it's not the person, it's the demon. And this is what's happening here. This man that they're trying to cast these demons out of, these demons, probably the, the head demon, the legion demon, the head demon speaking through them. And then the man in verse 16, in whom the evil spirit was, leaped on them and overpowered them and prevailed against them. So they fled out of the house naked and wounded. So in dealing with the devil and dealing with demons, you know, it's, you have to have a, a real relationship with Jesus Christ. And then you got all power and authority and they can't harm you. Amen. Can't touch you. Can't harm you. And that's the key here. That's what's going on here. And, and look at this. Look at the effect. This became known both to all Jews and Gentiles or Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. And fear, that is a fear of God fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Glory. I mean, even in this this failure by these men, beloved, in using the name of Jesus, uh, Jesus, our Lord, is glorified. You have to understand, the Lord doesn't need our help to glorify him. He just wants our obedience and our faith, and the Lord will glorify himself. And even in this apparent failure, God is moving in the midst in Ephesus. Read read the epistle to the Ephesians this week. You'll be astounded what's there. And so here, and all, verse 18, and many who believed, now catch this, many who believed came confessing and telling their deeds. So a revival breaks out in Ephesus and people are coming and they're confessing their sins and they're laying out their evil deeds and they're repenting of it and they're giving their lives to Jesus. There's this wonderful, wonderful revival that breaks and then there's something that deeper happens. They cut off the tree of sin out of their lives, but there's a stump left. There's a stump left. And the stump is this in verse 19. And many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, total 50,000 pieces of silver. And the effect of that, the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. See, they not only repented of their sins and they're saved, but there's something more that they must deal with. And they dealt with 
the curious arts. In the Greek, it's called curious arts. That's always a reference to the occult. Occult, by the way, just means hidden. Hidden. And what the devil likes to do is hide behind sins. Hide behind darkness. And once he's exposed, then he can be dealt with and cast out. And this is what's happening here. They're bringing, think of this, they have been set free. They're come confessing their deeds and, and their sins and they're born again. And then they come and they're bringing their magic books, their occult paraphernalia. They're coming and they're laying it out and they're confessing these deeds and being set free. And we're told that mightily the word of God prevailed and moved. And why is that so important? Because the enemy seeks to hide behind these occult sins. And they're a very specific thing. They're a very specific thing. And this is important uh, that you understand. Cindy and I were brought up under a, a, a man who was a prophet and a he was a theological professor in a seminary and he got filled with the Holy Ghost. He was a Southern Baptist and he got the left foot of fellowship because he believed in all the prophetic and the outpouring of the spirit and speaking in tongues and prophesying. But God mightily used him in the early days of the charismatic revival. And he was the, the pastor for Cindy and I for 14 years. And one of the things he did is he wrote books. And this one is called Angels of Light. You know, the devil, when he comes to you, he doesn't come as the devil. He comes like an angel of light. Trying to deceive you. And what God wants you to know is that God wants to expose that, if that's in your life. Any of the occult. This book was produced by Logos International, Logos International back in the day. It was a preeminent publisher back in those days. Tens of thousands of these were passed out at Billy Graham Crusades. And they went all over the world back in those days. And what God was doing was he was not just saving people because there were people being saved all over the place in that charismatic movement. You know, Cindy and I have lived through several movements of God in America here. The charismatic movement, the faith movement, uh, the pr prophetic movement in the 80s, the apostolic movement moving up into the 2000s. You know, we've lived through these, been a part of them in various degrees. And in the charismatic movement and faith movement, we are a vital part of that, became leaders in it. We had a church that started in a living room with our pastor, with 12 people. In a span of about five years, we had a church of over 2,000 people. When God gets ready to move, folks, watch out. Watch out. And so people, Christians, don't know that the enemy will continue to harass them, keep them in bondage, keep them slaves to sin addictions, darkness, oppression, poverty, troubles in relationships because of the occult, the demonic in their background. And they never deal with the stump. And, and one of the things that he brought out, and of course, you, you can go in any good Christian bookstore today and you'll find good teaching on the demonic and uh, kingdom of darkness and deliverance. This was one of the early volumes that was produced back in those days. But, but what it did, look, if you've ever played with the Ouija board, ever had your palm read, ever paid attention to your horoscope, you know, you ever been a part of table tipping or anything with divination, if you've never confessed that and dealt with that, that stump's still there. The devil can harass you because you have to close doors to Satan and not permit him to operate in your life. And if you've never done that, then this can go on. A little personal family history. My, my own family had involvement in various ways in the occult. Uh, magic healing. Uh, Table tipping, Ouija board, seances, palm reading, all in my family background. 
my grandparents, my great-grandparents, even my own parents, good old Uncle Max, the occult. And it's important you know that because that's something the Lord Jesus had me get rid of. Magic healing, you say, well, well, like, I remember Grandma taking a potato, cutting it in half, wrapping it in a, in a rag, rubbing it on a wart, and then burying it. And the wart disappears. You say, how could that be? How many, use, how many of you use potato juice to get rid of warts? None of you. It's all called. It's magic healing. Taking you a little bit deeper here this morning, folks. How about water dowsing? That was in my family. Old Uncle Max. Water dowser. Go along, you know, have that willow branch or a loose branch, and you know you're looking for water. Woo! Need that water. Whew, that thing would... And people say, oh, that's just the magnetic powers. Really? A willow branch? Like a fishing rod? And then it just, boop, like that? And then you go down and there's water? Uh, for generations, absolutely it works. I've had people come out, you know, want to do, drill wells for me. And I said, how are you going to find this water? Oh, we have a guy here who water dowels us. I said, uh, you know, we won't be needing your services. Right. We, won't, we won't need your services. Or you're not going to search for water that way. Just go right over there. See if there's water. And they go over there. Water dowsing. You ever have you ever thought deeper, folks? You ever yeah. thought through, through some of these things? Look, if it's not coming through Jesus Christ, it's coming from another source. Yeah. Right. right. Amen. It's either coming from heaven and the Lord Jesus Christ, or it's coming from the earth and the enemy. I carry around. Tw- uh, table tipping, card table. We used to table tip. Oh, Uncle Max said it was just the magnetic powers were real strong that night, but that old table you'd raise up on two legs. And if the power is really strong, get up on one leg and just hang in the air. I was a kid, and I'm doing this because I didn't know any better. And then you would ask the table questions, and it would answer you by banging on the floor or Oh, saints, if you don't think the demonic, if, you, if you're reading your Bibles and think, oh, that only happens in Africa, you know, all the demons over there in Africa, you know, they're all over there in Africa, you know, they're down there in the Congo of South America, you know, they're, they're down there in the, you know, the, the jungles Amazon of South America, you know, they're all, wake up, folks. Everywhere we look, we got the occult. There's what used to be taboo. Uh, 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 we against the occult in America became, has become very acceptable. You, you can go to, the, to, the, to certain stores and there you'll have Ouija boards you can buy. There's Kubala, uh, all these different games. Who are you appealing to with those games? If it's not in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you're wanting information from. And God condemns us. You see, it's the same as seeking out another God. Yeah. Right. And it's a, it's, a, it's a violation of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods but me. And remember how I read to you out of Deuteronomy 18? When the Lord is telling Moses, look, you're coming into this land. And all these people do these things. I, I think I should wor- read this. I don't think all of you got that. But it's very important. And the answer was what? The answer is, I'll raise up prophets. Right. Instead of going to the occult and the demonic, I'll raise you up prophets and spiritual men and women. Deuteronomy 18, let me just refresh your memory. Just real quick, I want you to see this. Because God really wants you to deal with the stump this morning. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, that is, child sacrifice. 
killing of, of the infants. Huh. Yeah, right. One who practices witchcraft or a soothsayer or one who interprets omens or a sorcerer. He's talking here about your charmers, your, your hypnotists, your um, uh, uh, people who divine, tarot cards, tarot cards, you know, or tea leaves. That's a big one. You know, looking in the cup and divining by the tea leaves, the position of the tea leaves in the cup. All of these things, beloved, God condemns because it's the same as seeking another God. Who's giving that information? You know what, what was really, really got me? Is we would ask that table, bang, bang, you know, questions. We would ask that table questions and it would get them right. One bang for yes, two bangs, bang, bang for no. So we would ask it yes and no questions. And you know what, get it right. It wasn't magnetic power. It was a demon. And if this is new to your ears, Lord, just pour your grace upon your people. And just deal with that fear. Right now, I take authority over that fear. You have nothing to be afraid of here in Christ Jesus. Nothing. But you have to understand these things. Beloved, for you to set others free, you got to be free yourself. Right. I'd just been saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. I was courting my sweetheart back in those days. And we'd gone out on a date, had been saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And I'm driving along with her. And I know that that night is going to be the junior, senior, all night party at the high school. The junior, senior, all night party at the high school. And every, at our school back in those days, they would bring a hypnotist in. Now, I don't know what you know about hypnotists. It's kind of been sanctified by medical science and psychiatry. Is that's okay. But listen, anytime you're giving your subconscious over to another human being, you're crossing lines, folks, you don't want to cross. Right. You don't want to give your subconscious over to any other human being. And they tell you, oh, you won't do anything evil or not. Well, but yeah, but, but it's happened. Where they've told people to do things. So let me tell you my story. I'm this 22-year-old kid. Fairly saved, filled the Holy Ghost for a few years. Taking work. Cindy and I are driving along, and suddenly the Spirit of the Lord just dropped on me. And he said, go tonight to the high school. And Im immediately I knew what he meant. He wanted me to go to the high school that night and confront that hypnotist. And so I remember, <laughs> I mean, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. And I remember just kind of quickly turning around. I, I get Cindy home and I just kind of, I said, Cindy, get out. <laughs> she, she's always so sweet. But she gets out and I drive off to the high school. And it's about 10 o'clock, 1030. He comes in at midnight. And I'm looking out across this high, we had a big high school, and I'm looking out across this parking lot, and it's filled with cars. I'm thinking, Lord, how am I ever, how am I ever going to get a hold of this guy? Because this guy would come in, and no, nobody else could get in. You know, they locked the doors down. And I'm thinking, Lord, how am I ever going to? How am I going to do this? But you know, the Lord will work this out. And so, so I'm sitting there and I got the, it was a warm summer night, just like it's been here. Got the windows down in the car and I got my head on my steering wheel and I'm praying. Oh, Rabbi Diviato, Lord, help me, help me, help me, help me. And then suddenly across over here on the driver's side out, my left hand window, my window here, I hear this sneeze, but it's like an elephant. Just kind of trumpets out, woo -hoo -ah -hoo! you know, like woo, out across the park. And it makes me look up. I jerk up my head and I see him because, you see, I'd seen him before. I remember the night I was a part of a junior, senior all night party and they told, he told one young man who was usually picked on and made fun of that night to act like a monkey before all of us sitting up there in the seats. And you know, he did. He made a fool of himself. Someone who didn't need to make a fool of himself. So we had a good laugh, but that dear brother didn't. Anyway, 
I look up and there he is. He's moving across the parking lot. He's way up ahead of me. I get out of the car and I start moving toward the school. And he goes around the corner of the school. He's going this way. I'm coming this way. And I get right around the corner. He's about 30 feet in front of me. I say, hey! You know, I, I can be loud. And, and he, you know, he startled me. He turned around. And he looks at me. I said, and I said, I said, hi. And he smiled. And I, I said, are you the hypnotist? Of course, I knew he was. I said, are you the hypnotist? He said, well, yeah. Yeah, he said, I said, oh, I said, uh, and I don't know what, I look, folks, here's how green I am about this. I'm shaking. And it's not all the anointing. It's not all the anointing. But you know, if you're not, if you're going to obey the Lord Jesus about things, just obey him. You're going to find out his power is great. Right. His power is great. And I said, uh, I said, you're the hypnotist? He said, yeah. So I, I didn't know what I was going to say. So I, I just said, I said, well, how do you do that? And he said, well, you know, it's all in the inflection of the voice. And right in the middle of him explaining that, I said, I said, no, I said, no, it's not. I said, it's the devil. It's Satan by which you do this. I remember he just smiled at me. He just smiled at me. And then I said this. You want to be prophetic? Here we go. I pointed at him, I said, in Jesus' name, you will not be able to hypnotize one person. And I remember he smiled, he had this, I don't know what kind of a smile it was, it wasn't very pretty. He had this smile and he stuck out his hand, he said, you want to bet? And I just said, nope. And I just backed off, I said, Duh, it's done, you won't be able to hypnotize anyone. And I left. And I went home. And I remember walking into the kitchen. Mom and dad had gone to bed. It's all quiet in there. I remember I just kind of fell down at the kitchen table. and said, oh, Lord God, what have I done? <laughs> because I'm learning. But God is developing a faith in me. He's developing a boldness in me to deal with Satan and to see him crushed under my feet. And this is what God's going to do with you. He's going to crush Satan under your feet if you'll let him. Glory to God. All right, I'm about done. Fast forward, next Sunday meeting, we're in church. Three-car garage, it's packed out. I stand up, give the testimony I just gave you. And then I said, and the last thing I said, but I don't know how it turned out. And as soon as I said that, a woman about two rows back said, I know what happened. And I turned around. She said, my daughter was there. My daughter was there. And he had a very frustrating night. And I had a hard time doing anything he wanted to do and getting people hypnotized. And he finally, out of frustration, just walked out the double doors. You have power. You have power. Yeah, you want to give Jesus a hand clap on that one? You have power in the name of Jesus Christ. Even as a young 22-year-old kid, you have power in the name of Jesus Christ to deal with the devil and the change. I, I don't know how many kids might have been saved from the oppression. You see, that's an open door to go under hypnosis, play with the Ouija board, have your palm read, follow the stars, any of that kind of, those open doors to the devil. You're saying, well, come on in, devil. And then you wonder why you're depressed, sick, poverty stricken. You have relational problems. You have uh, um, problems with, with dealing with issues in your life. And you wonder why you struggle. So it's because, listen, you, you're born again. You've been freed from all your sins, but you never dealt with the stump. God is wanting you to deal with the stump. Will you deal with the stump this morning? So you can be free of this. So I'm going to close now. Here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer to be freed from the stump. There's all kinds of delusions and deceptions. Remember the Spirit's words through Paul in 1 Timothy 4.1. The Spirit says expressly, it's interesting how Paul said that. He said, especially. You know, it's like he's really, he's really pressing it, especially in the last days. 
Many are going to depart from the faith. And I guess you've heard, those of you who are tapped into this kind of stuff, there's been some recent leading people in the church, in the gospel music business, who were leaders in the gospel who are now renouncing their faith. And, and I hope you don't stop praying for them if you happen to know who they are, that they could be recovered. But beloved, it's a very frightening thing when you say, I'm, I'm not a Christian anymore. I reject Jesus Christ. That is, by the way, the UPS. You say UPS? The unpardonable sin. That's the one that, that and blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Unpardonable. And no, you haven't committed it if you've ever thought you did and you were worried about it. People who commit that don't care. But I'm going to invite those of you who desire this to go through this prayer with me that you might remove the stump. And I believe you're going to see a change in your mind, in your emotions, in your body in your finances, and in your relationships. Because some of you have left this door open. You've cut the tree off. There's no more sin in your life. You're born again. You're going to heaven. But there's a stump. You never dealt with that Ouija board or that magic healing. By the way, hypnotist, that's that's charmer. I think King James has it as charmer. That's your hypnotist. So here we go. Those of you who want to do this. So, Mr. D, can I just not have any music on this one? Not till we're done. Because I, I think it's just that important. But, beloved, one of the things that the true prophetic does is they expose Satan. They expose the devil. They're the eyes of the church. They expose the devil. And so he's been exposed this morning. Some of you have been thinking about this. Oh, man, I, I, don't, I, I read my horoscope. I, I played with the Ouija board. Uh, and this can involve, by the way, false cults. If you've ever been a part of a false cult, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, any of those other kind of cults, who's behind that, those cults? Well, Satan is. Of course. So here's what we're going to do. And I'd like for those of you who want to partake in this just to do it right now with me. I'd like you to bow your heads. I don't want uh, anyone looking around. We're not going to look around. We're just going to pay attention to ourselves. And Father, I just take authority over everyone, everything here under the uh, move of your spirit and the presence of your spirit this morning. I thank you, Father, they are safe and they are protected. And the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus prevails. And Father, I just want to thank you that your angels are present to minister with me in this. And that this flow of your Spirit, Father, will register true with their hearts and their lives. And they will examine the Scriptures and they might be freed. But Father, this morning you're removing the stump. I understand now, Father. You're removing the stump. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, here's the first thing I want to do. Just follow along with me. Heavenly Father, I confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. I believe that he has washed away all my sins. And as a child of God, a son and daughter of God, I am free. Now, this is not a matter of your salvation. It's a matter of deliverance. (laughs) Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, I confess all of these occult sins. 
Did you say occult? All of these occult sins. Now, I want you to think all the things you've been involved in. Maybe in your family background, like mine. Because when I went through this, I just start naming them off. Heavenly Father, I played with the Ouija board. I was involved in table tipping. Uh, I was involved in, in uh, palm reading, reading my horoscope. Lord Jesus, uh, I received Jehovah's Witness literature and uh, 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 listened to them when I was a child. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I, I confess any magic healing. Father, I, I confess water dowsing. Heavenly Father, I confess any other occult thing. Heavenly Father, being hypnotized. Lord Jesus, any other occult thing I confess to you now is sin. And I ask you to forgive me. And I ask you to forgive me. All right, you doing it? All right, now. This is not a prayer. This is not a prayer we're going to do now. You're going to command. You're going to give a direct command to Satan. You ready? Here we go. Satan. Satan. Yep, name him. Satan. Satan. I command you, I command you to, release me to release me from all oppression, from all oppression. Depression, depression, oppression, oppression. Of, any sort, of any sort from the occult. From the occult. In, Jesus name. In Jesus' name, I close the door, close the door of my heart, my heart to you forever. In Jesus, name. In Jesus' name, I am free, I am free. By, the the by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony, of my testimony. through Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus Christ. In, Jesus In, Jesus In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Jesus', Jesus name, Jesus. go, go. Now. now. In Jesus' name, Jesus. I, am I am free by the blood of the Lamb. The of the Lamb. I am free. I am by the blood of Jesus, my mind, my body, my soul, my spirit, in Jesus' name. Whoo. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Lord, bless your dear sons. Bless your dear daughters. In Jesus' name. I've seen hundreds of people. Over the last 50 some years, folks set free just by doing that very thing right there. You're going to see a difference this week. Some of you are going to see a real difference this week. Things are going to start shifting and changing. Because what you've done there, you know what you did? You did this. You took that stump and you wiggled it and you got rid of it. And listen to me. This week, because I've gone through this more than once. Is I learn about a little family history that, oh, they were involved in that. Heavenly Father, forgive me of that in Jesus' name. Satan, I rebuke you and I kick you out right now. So I've gone through this more than once. So if you find out and if you think of things that's all cult and demonic, then deal with it. You have that power and that authority. This little book went to all brand new converts in Billy Graham's Crusades in the early years of the 1960s and 70s. And it set tens of thousands of people through free after they'd received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's a marvelous thing. God re reveals deeper truth. Anytime you have a move of the Spirit of God and you have a men and women of God who are moving in the Spirit, revelation gets revealed out of the Word that many people for years will just read but they never deal with. Like, oh, that's for back then. Rather than realizing it's for now. But let God continue to draw your heart to himself. And don't allow the enemy, you, say no to the devil. And you watch the Lord Jesus Christ crush him. Romans 16, verse 20. Crush him under your feet. Amen. Yeah, look, there's going to be some things. You're, you're going to notice the different things that used to hassle you. Some of those little imps in your head used to hassle you, perch on your shoulder and tell you lies. They're going to be gone now. They won't be around anymore. And the more you praise God and the more you draw close to him, 
the freer you become. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, glory. I guess we can have some music now. You know, you, you learn these things. I would encourage you to go to some good Christian bookstores, go online. Uh, just look up things about Christians and being delivered from the occult. There's books, pamphlets, teachings, videos. This is nothing new. This has been going on now since the beginning. I read to you from the scriptures. And it's always so significant because of the freedom that people begin to, to experience a joy and a freedom in their thinking, in their relationships. They never have, even financially, you know, people don't understand the enemy works through these things to keep things bound up in their lives. It's like they have an open door and you've got to deal with that open door. You've got to close that open door to the devil so he doesn't have access to you anymore. You see, that's why you, you never want to, you never want to put up with sin in your lives, beloved. You, you know, you don't, you don't want to hang on to hatred toward anybody or a grudge toward anybody or resentment or because those are all door openers to the enemy. You just, you don't want to do that. So forgive them. Move on. Make it right. See what God will do for you. And you are going to set many free because you're free yourself. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Hallelujah. Why don't you stand? Hi, this is Tim McNeil from Genesis Recordings, and I'd like to remind you about the 2019 Prophetic Conference coming to Genesis Church, August 23rd through the 25th. Dr. Tim Hines opens the conference on Friday night at 6.30. Tim has a page on the genesischurch.tma.com website. Saturday morning at 10, Dan Reese speaks and also closes the conference on Sunday night. Dan also has a page on the genesischurch.tmape.com website. Chris Reed will be at 6.30 Saturday night and Bobby Joe Brown Sunday morning at 10. There are hotels available within one mile of the conference site. Directions to Genesis Church of Seymour are posted on genesischurch.tmape.com. We look forward to seeing you at the conference and may God's word continually grow in your life.